Well, thank you. It's an absolute privilege to be with you uh, this evening, and I think it, it's just an incredible uh, innovation, I do think, in these coupe scholarships. So I, I really wanted to just, again, also echo Stuart's thoughts and acknowledge that I think this is a wonderful addition to the academic landscape in New Zealand. And I do think for the university and all of the energy and the people that have come together to, to make it happen, uh, and to John McCall Mc, 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 sorry, uh, John McCall McBain, I always get it the wrong way around in terms of with a with a double barrel, but um, but I think it's just you know his generosity, what he's done for the roads, but also what he's done more broadly uh, with these sorts of scholarships around the world. I just think is absolutely extraordinary. Look, what I wanted to share with you this evening is just some reflections on why I think a scholarship like this is actually needed. Clearly, there are many great scholarships in New Zealand, at Auckland University, around the world, but I do think there is something very special about the why uh, of, of this scholarship and why I think it really matters. Uh, I'd also like to share with you just some reflections on the type of young people that I think the scholarship should be looking to unleash and should be looking to target. I'd like to again share some humble thoughts on, I think, the type of interventions and the type of apprenticeship and gifts that we can give these young people to unleash. And then finally, just an aspiration around the impact, the long-term impact that I think is needed from these sorts of scholarships and the sorts of talent and young people that we do need to apprentice and unleash and inspire, given the opportunities and the challenges that I think our world is facing and closer to home that our country is facing going forward. And I actually couldn't think of a better construct than Coupe to actually help us find, nurture, grow and unleash some of the talent that we're going to need to really help steward and nurture our great little country in, in the years to come. So firstly, also to congratulate you, I think the choice of name is clever. I really do love the notion of Coupe. And a couple of reasons that I claim I'm not, I'm, I'm an august company, I'm not a scholar in any shape or form around the history of Coupe or my understanding of Whakapapa. Uh, but last Christmas I did devour Tangata Whenua uh, history, that, that wonderful work which again I know Auckland University had a lot to do with. And there are four things about Coupe that I do think are incredibly symbolic of what this scholarship stands for. To start with, he was first. Um, as New Zealanders, we like to be modest and humble, but we actually do love when people are first. Be it Hillary, be it Rutherford, be it first to see the sun. Every Whakapapa goes back to Coupe, real or imagined, but everyone, every year we finds a way back to Coupe. He was first, and I think there's something about that being first and, and being you know, the, the leader of that type that I also think represents the scholarship very, very well. The second thing is he was real. As far as we know, amongst there's always mythology and what was, and we know Maui was mythology, but as far as we know, on the balance of probabilities, Coupe was a real individual. He was a real person. He was actually the first to arrive in New Zealand. And again, others claim him. There's other sort of evidence that we have. But the balance of probabilities, he was a real individual. And I'll come back to why I also think authenticity and authentic leadership and a realness is going to be important. So I think the fact that he was a real figure is important. The third thing, he, he was an incredible pioneer. And I think in the narrative of Coupe, we actually don't acknowledge enough the skills of navigation, of seamanship that were required to actually have got here. The other thing is also, he was a pioneer in a unique time. One of the insights for me in reading Tangata Whenua was this notion that no one could ever figure out that how were we settled in the 1300s when we had sailing technology that could only deal with following winds when there were, have always been headwinds. So how did you actually reconcile that? Well, the new hypothesis with quite a lot of evidence is that at that was actually a period of significant climate change where the winds were actually the other way around. So rather than predominant westerlies, there were predominant easterlies. So the technology was actually possible to get from the Society Islands to New Zealand. So I also think the symbolism of being a pioneer in a particular moment of time that needed it. And I'll talk a little bit about the context. Stuart kind of stole my thunder a little bit with Trump and the role that he's playing. But I do think there is something about the age that we live in and the need for genuine pioneers and looking for as it were, the DNA of individuals that are most likely to have the bravery and the intellectual curiosity that will actually seed those ideas and the innovations that we're going to need. 
And the final element about coupe, in the end, he's ours. There is something about that I love about the scholarship, that it is ours, it's designed for, for New Zealanders, for Kiwis. And I do think there is, in a global world, I do, for my sins, have five kids. Uh, they've all grown up abroad. I've brought them home because they wanted to study in New Zealand, but they're all of a sudden now looking at, you know, as I said, why not Auckland University? And well, you know, but how does it rate with Oxford and Harvard? And, uh, and I think there is something about actually creating something distinctive and special that is ours, that to Stuart's point, is that glue that is magical and can compete in that truly global world that we are in today, that it does take the coupe type interventions of the world to be competitive, to keep our best young people at home and engaged in our issues, in our country, in our way. So I think the fact that coupe was ours, it wasn't a Shing here or a Christopher Columbus, he was our explorer, he was our pioneer in that sense. So I love it that he was first, he was real, he was a genuine pioneer and he's ours. And I do think the symbolism of that for the scholarship, uh, in, in, in my view, I think you've aptly named these, these scholarships in a wonderful way. A little bit on the why. why. Why a need for a scholarship like Coupe? Why in this particular time? Well, I do think um, it was interesting if you heard, you probably don't, but for someone that lived in, in China for as long as, as I did, this 18th Party Congress that occurred last October in China was truly historically significant for some good reasons and some not so good reasons. Um, but amongst the good reasons, President Xi did actually talk about we live in genuinely historic times. And when the Chinese talk about living in genuinely historic times, you normally do tend to listen, given their, the length of history that they look about. But you know, some of the things that I, I do think to add weight to that, if you look at the current technology revolution that we're in the midst of, it's 100 times faster and 300 times the scale of the original Industrial Revolution. For the mathemat mathematicians amongst you, you'll get that, that that's 3,000 times the intensity of what was the indus in original Industrial Revolution. There's something unique about that intensity and that pace and that scale. Um, Lord Stern, who I think is a brilliant individual that I've had the opportunity to work with over many years, is one of the world's leading advocates around climate change and the materiality of what we do. He talks about that we currently are consuming planet Earth at the rate of two planets. Now, by anyone's definition, that's not really sustainable when you consume planet Earth at the rate of two planets. Um, most economists, uh, certainly my organisation, is writing a lot at the moment around we're at the end of a 50-year consensus around how you run an economy, how you run a society, how you run a democracy. Many people talk about us being in a period of the great disequilibrium, where many markets and society, and we're just we're out of equilibrium. What will it take to get back to equilibrium? How do we find the pathways there? So I'm a, a strong believer that we are in an, a period of time that's not all doom and gloom. There's extraordinary opportunity. But I think we need a level of intellectual curiosity. We need leaders who will explore and pioneer and do things in a different way, in the way that Coupe was faced with quite a different climatic reality and the opportunity that he seized as a result of it. And I think we need to groom and unleash young people that have the skills, have the mindset, have the ambition, have the resilience to be able to be at the forefront of developing those things. And I, you know, as a Kiwi through and through to my bones, believe maybe naively, maybe without fact base, but that we're actually really good as a people in those sorts of moments. Um, when you look back to the very first depression, a gentleman by the name of Edward Tregear, our first Minister of Labour, actually created the world's ever jobs agency the first ever matching of jobs and moving people around and the interventions to make that happen. We really did innovate much more than Carolyn Webb did around creating a social safety net and creating opportunities for all. And I do think there's something about Kiwis in our DNA that we are, maybe we cruise a bit too much when things are good, but when there is moments of dislocation and disruption, we are often at our best. And I believe it's also our young people that are at the best in those moments, and that Coupe offers an opportunity to really find and groom and apprentice those young people that can really be at the forefront of this unique context uh, that we live in. It's also interesting in terms of in this moment of time, uh, McKinsey and Company, the company that I work for, prides itself on sort of scooping the best talent globally. 
And we've always, you know, gone to the best universities in the world and sought to get the very best people. But for the first time, we're actually going off piste and are actually thinking quite differently about the sort of talent and the sorts of skills. This year, we've gone looking for 100 Nelson Mandela's, baby Nelson Mandela's, that have no academic background. We've gone looking for nature's aristocrats, leaders that have just done extraordinary things and have been bold and brave. We've gone looking for leaders that have had extraordinary setbacks, that have had the resilience to overcome. We've gone looking for talent in quite different places. Now, I'm not saying that I think there's an, an importance to have an academic foundation, but I also think the magic of Coupe is also in that pioneering, exploring way, I think we should go looking for some different profiles, looking for some different characteristics of individuals that are going to uh, define leadership of the future rather than the patterns and the recognition of leaders that we've had historically. And again, just in terms of to not saying that these have to be the characteristics, but a few of the things that we go looking for that I again think in that coupe spirit that we could over-index on for our young people, I do think resilience, looking for young people that have resilience, either born with it or through you know, that muscle of resilience being tested through something in their childhood or teenage years that they've, they've overcome. I think there's something about empathy, Leaders that are able to empathise, that have wor worked and lived in other people's shoes, understand it, can empathise and, and glue and bring teams together. I think there's something about people that just take initiative, that are prepared to make things happen rather than let things happen. I think there's something about noble purpose. I think individuals that nothing guts me more than when I sit down with a talented young person and then you say, what's your aspiration? And they say to make money. And you just, your heart just sinks in saying, well, that's not a bad thing, but it shouldn't be the ultimate goal. That should be a means to an end. What, what do you want to do? What's the contribution that you want to make? And I think finding young people that are just burning with youthful idealism, with noble purpose, that want to make a difference, that want to make a contribution. And I also talk about people that are global. What we mean by global, people that have a global perspective, but they're deeply local. They're deeply passionate about their heritage, their people, where they come from, but also have the global perspective and the global understanding of where they uh, can contribute and how they can bring the best ideas back to a place like New Zealand and make real change happen. I then look at what are the things that Coupe could add to really unleash and unlock those individuals. Well, I think there's something about aspiration. I was talking about some of you. And again, I think many of us that have had the privilege of, of doing reasonably well in our academic careers and the like, there was someone that unleashed that seed of aspiration. Um, I remember arriving from the country, being given a spelling test and put in the bottom class of arguably what was one of the worst schools in Auckland. Um, going home, sort of not quite knowing how I'd break this news to my parents, that I was sort of in the bottom class of a school that they were quite disappointed that was the only school they could get me into. And I can remember, but I said, Dad, don't worry, it's not good, I know, but don't worry, the teacher said I could be a Rhodes Scholar. And my father going, not really knowing what that was, saying, well, son, I think you could do better than working on the roads. Um, <laughs> but again, someone had unleashed that aspiration. And I remember the same teacher actually had a saying, he was also our rugby coach, but he had a saying that if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. And that stayed with me for many years. And I do think with Coupe, there is something, particularly with our Polynesian young people, where I don't think they often know how good they can really be. And I hope that Coupe could be one way that we unleash ambition. We unleash mindset in terms of individuals. Uh, I remember one funny thing with Oxford, in terms of Oxford, when you arrive as a Rhodes Scholar, your first induction of basically they try and beat the youthful idealism out of you, saying that many young people have tried to change Oxford, but over 800 years, the institution always wins. And I remember this sort of notion of just trying to squeeze out of you this, this sort of sense of youthful idealism. I'd love that we did the opposite, that we amplified, that we, that we uh, as it were, put sort of you know, fuel on that fire of youthful, of unleashing the ambition of our young people. I also do think, and again, I think it's brilliant that uh, the New Zealand Leadership um, Institute is involved in terms of, I do think there's something about the pedagogy of leadership. There is something about how you lead yourself, how you lead others, how you lead institutions. And I do think being able to equip young people early 
with those often simple skills but incredibly fundamental skills of how they steward their leadership ambition and passions. And I really think that that's wonderful. I do think there's something about mentorship and sponsorship in every successful CEO and every successful public sector leader and every successful academic leader, you will always find a sponsor or a mentor that had that arm around the shoulder apprenticeship. And I really think the wonder of that Coupe is building that in, I think mentorship and sponsorship is absolutely critical and I think a wonderful intervention. I also think there's something about just the exposure to ideas. Um, I remember having dinner actually uh, with Edward de Bono in, in Auckland many years ago and asking him how, how, do you, how you've been so intellectually productive over the years. You know, when you look at how many books, the ideas, the range of topics. And he said, it's simple, I'm in a different city every day. Uh, I invite 12 interesting people to dinner and I get provoked just by the exposure to ideas. He then quoted me the G.K. Chesterton quote that creativity is finding a great idea and forgetting where you found it. And then he said, and I just, I connect dots. And for me, the magic is just being exposed to ideas and I connect the dots. And I do think, again, the wonder of some of the international places with a Rhodes Scholarship, I worked harder at Auckland University than I did at Oxford University. In many respects, the quality of the tuition was higher at Auckland than at Oxford. But there is something about the exposure that you get to the breadth of ideas at some of the world's leading universities that I think in today's day and age, we can replicate that. We can actually make that happen. And I think, again, Coupe could do that extraordinarily well. So I think there is something I just love, the design, the pedagogy of Coupe. I think there's something truly distinctive that not only will you find these special young people, I think you're going to add to them in ways that is more unique and more special than even things like the Rhodes Scholarship does for young people. So I think that that's just extraordinary. And long term, I do think the impact, when you actually take, um, you know, when you look at um, what has occurred with history, if we have a, a you know, a, 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 we start with a, a cadre of 20 young people. Uh, when you think of, you know, great revolutions, what it's taken to move countries, I've always been inspired by William Wilberforce, the individual that really led the abolition of slavery in the late 18th century in the United Kingdom. Uh, again, people forget slavery was the largest industry in the UK at the time. So being able to sort of turn over and remove the largest industry, that's not a trivial thought. But there were a dozen individuals that did that, that did, it wasn't just Wilberforce, it was Peel, um, it was you know, several others in terms of that, that, that were that team. If it took 12 people to overthrow arguably one of the greatest evils of our time and destroy the largest industry at the time, what could 20 young people do? And 20 young people, not just with one year, but over a generation, that if we, if we select for them, uh, if we apprentice and grow them in the way that we attend to, and that they have this unique moment in time, that I do think is actually pretty special in terms of uh, which pathway we go. I mean, again, I'm always optimistic about that New Zealand will always find the right way and will always get there, but there is nothing if we could unleash uh, I think some of our best talent, apprentice it, inspire it, unleash it, connect it, mentor it, then I think when we look back in 20, 30 years time, we may actually look in this humble gathering in uh, the corner in Princess Street as actually being really pivotal in our nation's history, that we actually sowed the seeds of growing some of our greatest leaders and our greatest young people that not only did magical things for our country, but actually provided a little bit of a beacon on a hill for a world that desperately needs it <laughs> when you have the leader of the free world <laughs> defending the leader of the not so free world <laughs> um, in terms of uh, where it is. So thank you for being here, Stuart. Thank you for everything you have done and your leadership and initiative for all of those that have done the real hard work to make this happen. I do think this is the start of, I think, something that will be pretty special and pretty unique uh, and that we'll look back in the years to come to say that we've grown some extraordinary young people. Hey, thank you so much for listening. Thank you.